Good. Well, thank, thank you, Heidi. Um, little, little did I know when uh, Heidi invited me to do this presentation that this would be the third presentation that I do in a single week. So hopefully I can keep this one separate from the others. I started the week talking about the Sentinel Lakes program, a program driven by the Department of Natural Resources that we work closely with. And yesterday, I had a 38-year career retrospective that I did in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, and now we're going to be talking about bathtub, and I'll be um, developed this presentation with my colleague John Erdman. John's been with the uh, MPCA about eight years now. <coughs> Came over from the dark side of consulting. But good man, he's, we're, glad, we're glad to have him with us. And actually, John and I crossed paths uh, many years ago, what, probably 20 plus years ago, in the course of Clean Lakes, Clean Water Partnership projects, using this very model and um, trying to do lake restorations and things, things like that. So, again, we've got, we've got a tool here that's been in use for some time. Thirty years. Thirty, not twenty years. Okay. Oops. All right. So Heidi, Heidi asked us to put the use of bathtub into our into our framework here, and where I see it being used is. First, initially, we, we've got our data. We've got our data on our lakes and our reservoir. We've got our inflow data and things like that. We do some initial modeling. We, we populate the model, and we try to get a sense of predicted in, predicted in observed concentration, and just rough our water and phosphorus balance. But later on, I believe it's used in this, in this phase as well, as, as uh, strategies are being developed. We're entering more into the TMDL itself, uh, refining our mass balances, and um, doing um, various, uh, various scenarios and, and things. So, so what we're going to do here, I'm going to provide you a general, a general description. We'll talk a little bit about some of the inputs that are required. We'll talk about strengths and weaknesses, just as I had asked. We'll give you examples from recent past TMDL applications where we applied it to the upper pond of Terre Lakes. Um, did that with Lee Angle, who's sitting over here, and then the upper upper Cannon Lakes. And then, then we'll uh, summarize that. So, the uh, bathtub model that was developed by Dr. William Walker about 1985, and this was for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The map that you're seeing here represents the range of reservoirs that were used in the, in the development of the model. Um, it's a public domain model. Anyone can, anyone can access this. I'd say that limited training is needed. There's a reasonably good health manual. The last printed one, I think, was 1999, but even within the model itself, the help screens are quite useful, good linkages. Um, one of the updates that's occurred since the, the original was the addition of the Canfield Foxman Lake model. So now we're able to better model lakes as in contrast to uh, some of the routines that you would use for reservoirs. The endorsement of, of this, again, this has been used by our agency as well as consultants throughout Minnesota since the early 1980s. We routinely use it to set phosphorus effluent limits or, or establish TMDL. So we, we do it, especially when we're, we talk about the phosphorus effluent limits, we're doing it for some situations where the decisions are very important and the results of those decisions can be very expensive. 
So it's a tool that we put put a lot of trust in. Wide range of applications, just some applications I've used are on um, long residence time lakes, things like Lake Malax. Recently we did White Bear Lake. We were asked by the Department of Natural Resources, how would the uh, augmentation of the water from a couple different sources impact the uh, quality of the lake? So we frame, we frame that up so we can get some early estimates and start to understand that issue. I've applied it to short residence time lakes, like Lake Peckham. Why is the chains of lakes, Sauk River chain of lakes, Ronda Terre, and others? And as well, this is a model that's used widely throughout North America. I can find many, many, many published examples of the application of this model for many of the same uses that we have. Um, looking here, just a stark contrast, here we have Lake Pepin. It's an extraordinarily large watershed, over 1,200 to 1 which means that it's water residence time, you measure it in terms of days, about maybe 15 to 30 days. That's in contrast to work within a Lake Malax. We actually were hired by the Malax band to participate in their Queen Lake study. And so we, we, we framed the bathtub model for the whole of Lake Malax. And that work today yet stands, I think, as some of the only uh, bathtub or complete eutrophication model of, of that resource. And here we see some simple estimated water budget and estimated phosphorus budget. So again, it can be applied to a fairly wide range of things. I would note that these two examples, they are on the fringe. They're on the fringe of the data development set. So they, when we apply it here, we're really testing, we're really testing the model. So it's very useful. What a relatively simple model. Mass balance, we'll get balances for phosphorus and water. Steady state, whereby inputs equal outputs. It models average conditions. We typically talk about summer averages, for example. It assumes well mixed conditions and zero dimensional. The inputs, uh, real basic inputs, you'd have to have these inputs for any modeling that you get. Your basic lake morphometry, you have to know the area of the lake, the average depth of the lake. You need to get your volume, you want to know the fetch of the lake, and various things like this. Then we need, for our observed data, we need summer average phosphorus, summer average chlorophyll and secchi. If we've got a good nitrogen sweep, total nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, we can add, add that as well. If you um, monitored for soluble orthophosphorus. That's a good thing to add in as well, but you can use the model without that. The water inputs, it can be measured or estimated. Phosphorus inputs, the same. They can be es estimated or measured. Fast up really is, um, when I think of it, it's really an assemblage of many models, an assemblage of many routines, uh, don't get caught up in all the little arrows here, but, but they're just demonstrating that there's a wide variety of linkages whereby uh, inflow phosphorus and the in incoming water allow us to calculate a variety of things, everything from residence time, the inlay phosphorus concentration, well, if you know the inlay phosphorus concentration, we go on to calculate summer average chlorophyll. From there, we can estimate the frequency of nuisance blooms and so on. So these are all um, built within bathtub and most become just routine, routine outputs from the bottom. So, um, example here of a simple water budget, the kind of inputs we often have some estimates either measured or estimated runoff, you have precipitation on, you have to estimate your evaporation off, you have your surface outflow. In some cases, like in the case with uh, both Malax and White Bear, we actually use some groundwater inputs. That's something you usually don't have, but in these two cases, we did. Phosphorus budget. Again, You've got 
your runoff coming in, you may be measuring that, you may be estimating it. There's an atmospheric portion directly on the surface. Again, we may or may not know groundwater and then surface water and groundwater. And important, the real important term ultimately is sedimentation, that which goes, goes to the bottom of the lake. The bathtub uses these um, fairly simple watersh watershed linkages. It's kind of neutral with regard to the various data sources you can use. You can have actual, say you've got a tributary coming into the lake, you gauge that tributary, and you're, you're measuring the phosphorus in that tributary. Well, that's an excellent, excellent source of data. Many times we don't have that, though. We use land, land use base concentrations or export coefficients. Many times these are standard from the literature. Other times we, we modify them a bit based on local knowledge. We sometimes have to incorporate in, in watersheds with high amounts of animal units, feedlots, pasturing, things like that. We have to try to factor that in as well. We'll take the animal units into account. We can have inputs for SWAT. HSPF is becoming a primary input for us. Um, as far as uh, what needs to reach tributary, it's just two averaging period numbers. We need a flow rate at average concentration and an average flow rate. And you put these things all in manually. There's, there's no way to import them from these different sources, but loading the model itself is relatively easy. One of the um, most important decisions that will be made, this is particularly important for TMDLs, or again, where we're setting NPDS permits, very critical, and this is where one's knowledge comes into play, but one's knowledge of uh, lake processes, reservoir processes, and that is getting the right model. You mentioned that, uh, what Canfield, um, Canfield Bachman model here. It's often a good choice for natural lakes, but if you take something like Lake Pepin, for instance, that would not be a good choice. There's other routines in there, and it's again, it's knowing some of the characteristics of the water body we're working with. And data availability. There are some models where you could factor in um, soluble orthophosphorus. phosphorus. But if you don't have that data, you can't select that model. So it's having these, these kind of insights that are important. And oftentimes, <coughs> it requires you to test the model to determine what the best application for the system is. And my rule of thumb is to minimize calibration. Minimize. Don't go to calibration first. Test, test your various models. This became a bit challenging where we're doing uh, the examples I'll show on Pond de Terre and Upper Cannon, you have different types of lakes in your system. You're able to select one when you're modeling uh, several in a, in a chain. Okay, so sometimes we have to work with the standard grains and phosphorus export or phosphorus concentration for different types of land use. Uh, estimated runoff. We're estimating that runoff, though, based on uh, knowledge of local runoff, local precipitation and stuff. So that, that's often, often uh, modified as needed. That's what we can have observed data. And this is an example from the canon. We have three years, 2008-9, of, in this case, phosphorus concentration. You can see that that's on the order of a lot, 400 micrograms or 400 parts per billion. That helps us like what we felt to be appropriate concentration then to use in, in that modeling for modeling for other areas that did not have the monitors here. And again, HFCF will allow us to even uh, improve again on those areas where we don't have actual monitors. So, completely mixed steady state, mass balance, outputs equal inputs minus storage. So, like this, completely mixed. And this assumes and requires the system to be in equilibrium. It's uh, not uh, 
Debbie, a system that's not still adjusting to recent changes. So again, relatively simple, not a, not a, mechan, not a mechanistic model. Here's examples of how we might segment or organize this scenario. The most common one up here is just a single leg in the reservoir. You've got your watershed draining in. Um, an example there, uh, things like molasses and white bear. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And we go on to some of these uh, spatially segmented. You might have several lakes or reservoirs coming in here. You've got a headwater condition here with some coming in. You've got a version there and so on. And this would be similar to what we did in the Palm de Chair or Cannon Lakes. So down here you might have impoundments in series, and that is quite similar to what we did with modeling Lake Pepin, where you have a series of uh, navigational pools that lead into the system. So you have a variety of different ways that you, that you, that you can approach this. Again, internal loading often crops up. It's that thing which we often don't actively uh, measure. It's something that occurs to some degree in almost all lakes. The model accounts for normal amounts of this. Normal amounts is what's found in the Army Corps of Reservoirs. Um, so it's this is driven by several factors. Among those factors are the sediment, biogeochemistry, low oxygen, or anoxia. It doesn't have to be anoxic above the sediments. Even low oxygen starts the processes that can allow for phosphorus release from the sediments. Accumulated external load. A lot of this isn't natural, it's, and it's occurring usually in its worst case lakes that have a, had excessive loads over a long period of time. And then other characteristics such, such as the shallow lakes, you often have a lot of reef suspension mixing. High temperature, high pH can promote internal recycling as, as well. This is sometimes overlooked. We think a little bit too much about oxygen, but uh, stimulation of bacteria and the release in that form can be important too. That address, addresses uncertainty and risk. This is just an example screen here of a bathtub output. It's a major strength of the software, particularly important as we were entering in the TMDLs. Had this back in 1985 already. This was a topic that wasn't even talked about that much at that time. And provides then sensitivity and error estimates. So let us. Uh, Okay, we're going to look here at an example. We're going to start on, on Pond de Terre. And we have our masters in the upper, upper watershed here. We're draining in there. So we have a stick diagram, and this was um, something that my colleague Bruce Wilson, it's the other Bruce Wilson, the now respect uh, Bruce Wilson. Stick diagram. He's big on this. This is a good way to organize your thinking for a project like this. You show the linkages. In this case, we've also indicated in green lakes that fully support, lakes that meet standards, red those that do not support. So here we are in the upper part, these units, and we're moving on down the chain. So a good, a good way to or organize your case, organize your thinking. Um, here in the upper watershed, we see um, the North Turtle Lake. And that one, that's an impaired lake. You see here, this is a typical basketball put the graphics are a little, little through. In red, we have the predicted phosphorus concentration. In blue, we have the observed concentration. The error, um, standard error, you can see that they overlap. They are not significantly different because of that. But observed is a little, little higher. Um, we model this in, in basketball. And we get a, a flow and phosphorus balance for it. And we find in this case that we can attribute much of the excess uh, phosphorus in this small watershed 
connected real. There's a large number of animal units and feedlots here, and we believe that is a primary cause of the excessive phosphorus in, in this lake. Um, further, this can help us with protection. You see several lakes there marked in green lakes that meet standards. So the the out, output here can help us as we develop our protection scenarios. Now, as we look across these, again, another bathtub output, we're looking at uh, predicted and observed phosphorus from the uh, top of the system here, Swan Lake, going through these lakes, and then eventually down the pond to here and here. We get pretty good agreement. This is an uncalibrated scenario. We have a pretty good agreement between predicted and observed mineral lake. <coughs> we're, we're seeing much higher phosphorus than the models predicting. We see that as well as Perkins. Perkins, I can understand that. We contribute much of that to uh, internal recycling. It's got all the characteristics, the shallowness, a huge carp population, and other factors that we lost from. Mineral lake, this didn't quite make sense. We went back to the observed data. And what we find, you know, what I think what Bruce Wilson was talking about this morning, in this case, I, don't, I think the model is probably okay. What's bad is our observed data. We found that the lake was being characterized by very few data points, and there seemed to be, uh, you know, a bit more variability. So rather than doing something special with our model or some excessive calibration, we um, looked to improving the observed data. Here is the next chlorophyll as well. We see pretty good agreement with the exception of North Pond is here. We predicted a very high chlorophyll, but chlorophyll was low. In this case, yes, it's, it's shallow, it's a very turbid reservoir, and there's just not enough light in the system or residence time in the system to produce algae at the rate that you would expect. Seckies can be predicted as well, and you see here pretty, pretty good agreement amongst these. Moving on, the upper Cannon watershed, a challenge, challenging watershed. Um, we're going to look at um, things for Lavasta, Fox, the Circle Lake here, and then we'll also look at things from uh, Dudley Kelly, the French, the Rovers here, just as an example. We modeled this in parcels. We broke this into meaningful segments. It helps in your assembling the model, but it also helps in communicating the results as well. And uh, Limitech is going on from the work we did. They're building on that work, and they call this building this in parcels to be uh, very helpful. Here's an area where um, considering the animal units was essential. There's many, many, many very small feedlots. You can see the flow lines here. You see many of these are located on or near. Well, that's a web image over there. Not atypical from what we would expect in different locations in these watershed. So we took this into account. Had we not taken it into account, I believe we would have underestimated the uh, phosphorus loads to the lake. You look at this, for example, all oh, this is draining to uh, Circle Lake. And we see some very high measured concentrations coming off of this watershed. Okay, so here's our predicted and observed Bentley, Kelly, French, and Rollbirds. Moving from the top, through here, through here. We see uh, in French and Rollbirds much higher, almost two or threefold higher than predicted. That's what Logan looks like. In each case there, the internal recycling potential is great. Uh, we, so we uh, bucked up the model, and for now we, we refer to that as unaccounted for. And we get these graphics we developed here, these could be developed easily from bathtub because the output comes in a spreadsheet, but um, it gives a sense of your um, how this could be used for a protection strategy. It shows you some suggested sources, or as we go on to our TMDL applications as well. The Nazca Fox and Circle, you see again that significant loading. 
the error estimates here and also uh, getting a sense for the responsiveness. Circle A here. And, th and this, this case, it's the response to reduction feed feedlot loading. So we see that it seems somewhat responsive. In contrast, um, the basket here, on-site loading, say if the question, how important are on-sites to the system? Should we sewer the entire lake to reduce phosphorus load? The basket would be relatively uh, insensitive to that change, that change in that proportion. Okay, as we wind up here, knowledge needed for funding and potential modification. It's an easy to use model. So it's important to understand basic logical and modeling principles for property use. Study state only. One of the things MPGA already did was help fund the transition to the Windows-based application that those that use the model are now using. A downside, U.S. Army Corps does not routinely update their website and some update conversions. Uh, Dave Savali, though retired, can still continues to do some of that. Um, I guess, in the short term, if you can't con con contact Dave, and you know, if you have some problems, con contact me, and I can find a way to get a hold of him. So, in summary, fast is a valuable tool for TMDLs, phosphorus affluent limits, and load allocations. It's been long used within Minnesota by the MPCA and consultants and across North America as well. Programs free through the Army Corps, and there's ample health documents available. MBTA has done trading, and actually we maintain some of that information in those modules on our site. Modeling at a watershed scale is a newer initiative for us. It allows for in-house development TMDLs, advances protection strategies, employs readily available water quality and GIS data, and it's improving our ability to develop TMDLs in a timely and cost-efficient manner. And with that, that's the Army, Army Corps uh, site. And with that, take questions.